they first um, put into foods? When did we start using them? What, what was the, the date? The date of the first genetically engineered food supplement that came to market, that was that L-tryptophan. Um, I can't give this, you to, this to you exactly. That, the first genetically engineered supplement started coming out probably in the mid-1990s. The, I'm sorry, mid-1980s, excuse me. The supplement that came on the market that caused the epidemic hit the market in 1989. Now, it's interesting, if you look at the, at the FDA's history of genetic engineering, they, they will say that the first genetically engineered supplement came later, and they don't even talk about that when they want to pretend it never happened. They'll say it was the genetically engineered uh, rennet, the chymosin, that uh, is, uh, produces the, you know, the rennet so that it, you can make cheese without having to use uh, cow's uh, innards or calves' innards. So they don't even give you the history correctly. They try to pretend that didn't happen. Now, the first genetically engineered whole food was the so-called flavor saver tomato. That came to market in 1994. Didn't stay on the market long because it actually wasn't that flavorful, and there were many reasons. Uh, the, and that came to market illegally and through FDA fraud, too, as my book shows. So if the FDA had actually told the truth on both the, the first supplement and the first whole foods, we wouldn't have probably even had the GE food venture, or if we did, there would have been much more rigorous testing. So, so with the... the, the the disaster that came about, the, when people got sick. Well, what were the symptoms? What, what happened that, I, don't, I just want to know what, what was the outcome of that? I mean, they got sick, right? Okay. They had extreme pain. I mean, we can make it really brief. They had pain that just would not go away, that was uncontrollable and swelling. And because it was strange, it was easy to tie back to tryptophan. If it had been something that lots of people experience all the time, we would not have found it. Was this something, what, where did this happen? All over the United States. It was yeah. like and, and some in Canada, too. Um, but the pain, many people became immobilized. And uh, more than 40 people died. And according to the latest uh, assessment of the Center for Disease Control, between four and 5,000 people were seriously sickened. Hundreds of those people were still invalids, you know, because but they- It was a lasting thing. It, it didn't clear, they didn't, like some of them didn't clear up. In some it cleared up, in many, unfortunately, it never cleared, or it cleared up a little, but many of them are still, you know, sick and not able to function fully because, you know, that uh, ingesting the first genetically engineered food supplement. And then when the people claim there's never been uh, an instance of either a cough or a sniffle associated with genetic engineering, I mean, it's, it's ludicrous, but they get away with it. You had a question? First one is uh, I had assumed based on very surface level research that um, the only foods that are commonly available which are genetically engineered are a list of like 11 according to, I just, I just did the Google search again, uh, corn, soybean, cotton, canola, sugar beet, alfalfa, papaya, squash, zucchini, uh, arctic apple, and this potato. Um, is that not true that um, if I that if I omit those foods, that I can still get GMO food sources. I think you left off salmon, didn't you? There's now genetically engineered salmon on the market as well, at least in Canada, uh, and there will be soon in this country if there isn't already. There may be something you missed, but those are the main ones that you, that you mentioned. And actually, if people just tried to avoid products from soy, corn, and canola, they'd be avoiding a large part of them. But, but the plan is, to, to do uh, reconfigure the genetic core of most of the foods if they can do it. And so in the pipeline, there are many, many, and there are plan, much grander plans. And if there hadn't been a lot of consumer pushback in Europe, uh, we would have a lot more genetic engineering of, of many more crops would have been genetically engineered than is currently the case. But even though it doesn't, the list you read doesn't sound like very many because products from corn and soy are, are so widely used in processed food, it's been estimated that close to 90% of the processed packaged food in North America does contain ingredients from one or another genetically engineered ingredient. So people are getting exposed, even if they don't think they are. So my, my second question, this is probably the most important one, um, for me anyway, 
so I, I understand that we share a lot of uh, genetics with virtually all life on the planet, and so I know that we have genetics in common with GMO foods, and um, I realized I had made this assumption. I was thinking that if I eat a genetically modified food, that then my genetics will become modified. Is that at all accurate? Is there any research into that? Is there any awareness of that? I don't think there's any direct evidence of that. Um, of course, the thing is our knowledge of genetics has been deficient, and the more we learn, the more we realize that we didn't know things. But I think the greatest risk that we know of right now would be the risks of unintended toxicity, unintended allergens, or that there could be anti-nutritive substances there that could uh, uh, harm your ability to extract the proper nutrients from that food or maybe create inflammation. So the risks of, of altering your own DNA, um, to my knowledge, that hasn't been one that's been documented and even theoretically gone into, but uh, that I won't go into that one myself. I would stick with the ones that I've heard scientists discuss. But you know, unintended toxicity, allergenicity, or otherwise, you know, harm uh, is, I think, enough at this point to raise the, uh, the the red flag of caution. I wanted to hear your piece on how you're affecting this. How we're affecting the change in the, the yes. genetic modifier? You actually might know more about this <laughs> than I do. Um, I can certainly say that uh, within the systems in synthetic biology that we're investigating in how the gene and protein and regulatory networks work together to understand what's going on. So uh, one of the recent advances was the... Would you say, Brian, that our knowledge is still rather limited compared to our knowledge of the human-made software systems? <laughs> yes, I, I would say that we're, we're, we're getting better, but, but our, our knowledge is not, not as advanced. A professor of molecular and cell biology at the University of California emphasized, he was writing about how little we actually know about, about uh, DNA and the genome. He said, most, the most, most important rules aren't even at the level of the genes. They're at a higher level of organization at which, where the rules are how the genes are expressed and interrelated. And he said, we don't understand those rules at all. And he said, in fact, those rules are, are basically transcalculational, which he stated is just a fancy mathematical word for, word for mind boggling. So really, you know, the, the intricacies of DNA are mind boggling. And we still don't fully understand them. We certainly understand them far less well than we do that the information systems that we create ourselves. And yet, we're making radical changes and yet not following the same precautionary principles at all, which, which really is, is it's reckless. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that is just outright reckless. Um, so I'm a biology teacher, and I speak to my students a lot about GMOs and have them spend a lot of time researching and debating this issue. And for the kind of millennium, millennial Generation Z, especially these high schoolers, they kind of focus on the more idealistic pros. Obviously, the promotion of GMOs in this country, as you said, has been more monetarily based in the promotion of biotechnology. But they talk about things like the cliche of golden rice, um, insulin produced by you know, genetically modified bacteria, thinking about things like algae being genetically engineered to be more productive in biofuel, and Mr. Battle talked about GMOs feeding the world. So I'm in a very much gray area personally about GMOs. It's a very case-by-case -case basis, but I wondered how you felt about the possibility of GMOs if they have been adequately tested in addressing some of these societal issues, and do they have the possibility to improve society? What would you want to see for those things? Okay, it's a, a big question. Uh, first, as my book shows, if, according to our best knowledge, not only from biological science, but from computer science, if we applied were to have applied that best knowledge and required testing that's commensurate with the level of rigor, at least with the level of rigor that we require for minute changes, minuscule changes to our own human-made uh, software systems, information systems, there really couldn't be any genetically engineered foods on the market because to test these foods, even if we just say, okay, test them to the level of pharmaceutical drugs, the, the venture could not economically bear that. Even if all those tests came
came out squeaky clean. You couldn't have actually gotten through them. Because think about it, pharmaceuticals, it's very expensive to do that testing. And the expense can be recouped by getting patents on the drugs and charging very high monopoly prices until the patent expires and the generic competition comes out. But there's only so much you can charge for soybeans and corn and papaya. So to try to recoup all that expensive testing wouldn't be feasible in the case of agricultural products, which is one reason that the industry resists testing so much. But then was part of your question, could there be great benefit too? Was that part of it? I thought. Yeah, yeah and, and so, and, and how would that, you know, how would we get there in a way that you think would be ethically sustainable? Well, let me how state that you know, we often hear the argument, even if there are risks, the benefits far outweigh them because we need these foods to meet the world's food needs, you know, requirements. And also we need them to meet challenges of climate change, to create uh, uh, heat resistant crops and saline re resistant crops and drought resistant crops. But actually if we, if we look at the facts again, we find that those claims just don't hold up. Now in terms of the claim that we need these foods to produce enough food to feed the world, one of the biggest, probably the biggest, best, most objective study answered that question very, very solidly. It was sponsored by the World Bank and four United Nations agencies. It was uh, conducted by more than 400 scientists in more than 80 countries, and, f more than f and at least 58 countries have endorsed it. It was called the International Assessment of Agricultural Knowledge, Science and Technology for Development. The, one of its main conclusions was that genetic, there is no significant role for genetic engineering to play in meeting the world's food needs, that we can meet those needs without relying on genetic engineering. And they stated what really is needed, the main thing that is needed, is what they called agroecological techniques, especially in the developing world. And they, agroecological techniques are organic or near tech organic techniques that are, don't rely on a lot of expensive external inputs. They work in harmony with natural processes. They build up soil instead of uh, often a t uh, depleting soil through uh, synthetic fertilizers and synth synthetic pesticides. And they're well suited to small subsistence farming in the third world. And they stated the evidence is that Agroecological farming, when done correctly, can outperform industrial farming and can outperform genetic engineering. And there's been other studies since then backing that up that the UN has actually released. So we don't really need that. In fact, at the press conference, the director of that study was asked point blank, so do you really see a significant role for genetic engineering? And he said, frankly, no. The arguments, it's also clear that conventional breeding has been able to produce drought resistant crops and, and heat resistant crops and salt resistant crops. Uh, so we really don't need genetic engineering. Oh, and indeed, the example, the famous example is golden rice, which keeps getting talked about and never quite gets realized anyways. Yeah. But it's going to that Steve and I were talking about that because I'm sure Vedana Shiva covered this really in detail when she was here. She would be really tuned into it. Already in the places where golden rice is supposedly needed. You might mention what the purpose of the golden rice right, is. The golden rice is supposed to be take, yeah. take care of people who are so poor that they can't get vegetables, so they get their vitamin A from rice. You know? now, blindness. Per, yeah, to avoid blindness. And personally, I bet if they look more deeply into that, they would see that it couldn't even work that way, that all the other nutrients have to be in tune with that for it to work. But the reality is that if those people are not driven off the land, deprived of their land, kept from the, their, the systems that they had have thrived in over hundreds and thousands of years, they had access to endless supplies of plants that have vitamin A. We could go out in our gardens and weed all kinds of weeds that if we stop to research it, are packed with more vitamin A than we find in most of our vegetables. And these people have access to the same weeds and the knowledge to get to them if they can just be allowed to stay on their land. There's also a wonderful book called 21st Century Greens that goes into a huge array of other plants that can be used for vitamin A. Things like cow peas are grown for their peas and yet the greens are loaded with nutrients. All kinds of trees and shrubs can be grown on the edges. Stephen said to me, 
well, what about rice? Because if there are there things that work in the water? I said, well, they could grow things on, their, on, their, on the dams where the rice are and stuff. And then I walked out of the farm, looked in this one little pool we have where we're experimenting with water spinach, which we want to control because it can become invasive. But if you live in a place where you need greens, invasive means productive. They get eaten. And water spinach thrives in these places. There's loads of plants that can solve these problems. And indeed, when he talked about potatoes and growing a potato to, to, to repel insects, Richard McDonald, uh, an entomologist who I cooperate, got his alma mater of Virginia Tech with um, Dr. Ron Morris and his assistant, um, Brinkley Benson, to do farmscaping trials. And they couldn't stop talking to me for years afterwards about the fact that after they did those trials, they could go in the potato patch and couldn't find the insects that normally attack potatoes. So there was no need for these poisoned potatoes simply using very obvious, very exciting agroecological methods solve these problems. And I could go on about this roundup, replay. There's, there's solutions to all those that we have. The thing is, those solutions can't be sold by corporations. Yeah. yeah that's the yeah. difference. Would you please go into the health effects? You've mentioned a little bit about the health effects of um, Crohn's disease and um, allergy and uh, um, things that, that of those natures that the um, genetic engineered foods produce in our bodies. And do we get viruses from them as well? Is there possible, you know, virus transfers? But I also want to know like, exactly what you think um, GE foods are doing to our bodies. It's, uh, you know, it's an interesting question. Uh, and there, are, there have been different, uh, different thoughts by different scientists and a lot of different uh, scenarios have been raised. But uh, clearly, we do know, as I've said, and I think it's worth emphasizing, it, we do know that genetic engineering can create novel toxins that are very difficult to detect unless there would be careful, very rigorous testing of the whole food, because you don't really know what you're looking for. And think of the case of the L-tryptophan. Um, it's only been within the last few years that scientists have finally uh, identified the chemical structure of the uh, case-associated um, contaminant that was statistically significantly related to the epidemic. There, have been, there were about six case-associated contaminants. That meant six contaminants that were associated with at least one toxic batch of L-tryptophan. But the epidemiological data, when it was all sifted through, and it took a lot to do it, it they found that only one uh, contaminant was statistically significantly related. Okay, so it was the one that needed to be studied the most. It was the one that was most elusive. They varied even through, through sophisticated technologies. A team at the Mayo Clinic, they couldn't quite figure out the structure. It was very difficult to do. And that finally has been done. My book reports on, uh, on narrowing that down and the implications. And they gave me permission to do it. But it just shows how difficult it had been. That epidemic was in 1989. And the structure actually finally, it's only been within the last few years, they finally were able to do it. Well, that's a huge lag between the epidemic and finally even knowing the structure and then trying to figure out, well, did it cause the epidemic? So we're talking about, again, the need for, for precaution. Also, here's a very troubling, I should mention this, just tryptophan, they have yet been able to get the toxic tryptophan to create the symptoms in animals. So animal models are not always a good model for human disease. That means that that's why it's important that even after animal tests, there should be clinical tests, as in the case of pharmaceutical drugs. To date, there have been no human clinical trials in the case of genetically engineered food. So, okay, to get back a little more to your question, but it, so it does show you that was, that was a toxic effect. We still don't even know exactly the mechanism by which Whatever toxin caused it, it did cause it. But we know that it created a lot of havoc. And um, you know, Dee touched on some ex you know, extreme pain, some paralysis in many cases, death. Um, 
toxicity can be manifested in many forms. So I'm not enough an expert on that to know, but it, it could be many different forms. Um, carcinogenicity, it could be, you know, a genetically engineered food could be causing many different forms of cancer. We just don't know for sure. We haven't done, done the studies. Uh, epidemiologists have stated that unless a genetically engineered food increased the rate of cancer, a particular rate of cancer, I think at least doubled it, we wouldn't really even know it against the background of it. So, and then, even if it did, how would we know which genetically engineered food had caused that? See, that's why they're really, these foods, that's why our food safety laws are very precautionary when it comes to food additives. New food additives, by law, in the US, are not supposed to come on the market unless they've been demonstrated safe beforehand. And the level of, te of demonstration is a high one. Reasonable certainty of no harm. It's illegal to even try to offset risk with benefits. You can't even factor in benefits if you're following the law. That's our law. In fact, we have the strictest food safety laws in the world when it comes to GMOs. The safety, stricter than in Europe. The only reason that they're on our market in, in uh, preponderance, in abundance, and they aren't in Europe, is that our Food and Drug Administration's been breaking the law and lying. It's that simple. And if they'd been following the law, these foods would have all been subjected to strict testing. And in Europe, they're still not even following their law. According to European Union food safety standards, their laws are supposed to be following the precautionary principle. But if you actually study it, they haven't been. What's kept, and in fact, the European Union, the European Commission in particular, has approved many genetically engineered foods for the human food supply. What has kept them off is consumer resistance. And consumer resistance has been high enough that the food distributors won't take them. So that's why they're not in Europe. Not, and, and why was consumer resistance higher? Because the European media reported the Pushtai study and some other problems, whereas the US media has shut down objective fair reporting on genetic engineering. There's a chapter in my book on that too, malfunction of the mainstream American media. It's just astounding the degree of of, in which the mainstream American media has refused to report facts that would uh, create consumer concern about genetically engineered foods and reported propagandas if it's scientific fact. And it's pretty astounding, actually. It's been happening. Um, and um, I don't mean to be, you know, I, I do believe that the media, by and large, the mainstream media does a fairly good job in many areas, but there are many areas that they don't, and uh, unfortunately, this is one of them. But I certainly would not go so far to, sit, to make a blanket statement, they're the enemy of the people. But they have been the enemy of the truth and the enemy of science when it does come to genetic engineering. I will go on record as stating that. Do we get viruses from the GA food and its food, GA food lesson? Well, can we get viruses from the genetically engineered food? Some scientists believe that there could be recombinations going on uh, within the viral promoters and uh, maybe viruses that are in other parts of viruses that are in the body and maybe some recombinations. To my knowledge, that hasn't been verified, but some scientists have read that as a potential concern. Um, we do know that uh, within recent years, it was discovered in that viral promoter I discussed, there was actually within it, there was part of a viral gene as well that wasn't understood. They thought it was only a promoter. And that gene, some scientists said, there are indications it might be expressing maybe perhaps a partial protein that could be a problem. Uh, my book discusses that. It's a little technical. I won't get into it. But there are scientists, in fact, one of them a virologist, who feels that there is a risk being posed by that partial viral gene, which was not known until a few years ago was even there. That, again, shows the limits of our knowledge. They thought all they were putting in it was a promoter, and they were actually adding part of a viral gene that was in that promoter as well. So again, it's very risky what we're fooling around with. Could it be a problem with nutrition? Well, uh, there could be anti what are called anti-nutritive uh, substances that are produced through genetically engineered food, and that could um, restrict our ability to, uh, to absorb nutrients from our food. Also, if the food's been sprayed with Roundup, 
Roundup is known to be a chelator. It will grab onto, uh, grab onto various uh, uh, minerals that we need. So that could be a problem as well. There are many other pro potential problems with Roundup. But as I stated, and this can't be emphasized, I think, strongly enough, we already have solid, uh, solid data that Roundup is toxic anyway, regardless of all the other potential problems, regardless of, the, of its potential carcinogenicity, which many experts have stated it is a probable human carcinogen. But even if we discount all of that, we have solid evidence it is toxic. It should be off the market by the, on the basis of that alone. Okay, so it, from just hearing the overall thing, uh, not having read your book, it sounds like you're fairly certain that uh, what the FDA and the National Academy of Science uh, and the media is doing is intentional. That's what it sounds like to me from what I'm hearing. And um, if so, then um, is it, like, what are their motives behind this? I mean, obviously there's some money involved, um, but is it, is it purely that, or do you feel like there's maybe some sort of social phenomena going on where it's just like new for biotechnology? So it's the question about the motivation yeah. behind all of that. Yeah, and it's a, certainly a, an interesting question. My book tries to deal with that, and it's difficult to figure out the, the multiple motivations. Clearly, you, you, you hit on one of the main ones, financial conflicts of interest. Um, certainly, we know why the industry is doing it, the profit motive. But because uh, in the case of genetic engineering, with the ability to patent genes or you know, patent organisms, then many university scientists all of a sudden were able to become venture capitalists in a way too. And they actually, you, there are many cases of university scientists who were part of founding biotechnology firms and they, you know, they had patents on some of the, the, the uh, either the organisms or the, the, the crops they were trying to develop. And there have been several cases or allegations of conflicts of interest. And even if they didn't have equity in, in these firms, then many biologists have had very cozy relationships with one or another biotechnology firm and they get nice consulting fees and, and whatever. So there are those. But there are many, uh, there are several uh, instances of scientists who apparently do not have that, that kind of level of conflict of interest, and yet they often go overboard in promoting genetically engineered foods. Often I think it's a case of arrogance, where they really feel that this is going to be so good and we have to do it, and they're so afraid that the, un, the ignorant public will get concerned that they that they, they have an end justifies the means psychology. Well, this is important and we have to say this if we're going to keep pushing it ahead. And often they're in a bubble. They talk to each other. And I think many of them actually start believing their own, you know, their own myths, their own propaganda. But in any event, I do believe that in addition to avarice, arrogance has to be factored in on the part of many scientists. And uh, thinking that we know better and you can trust us. And it's very clear some of, the, some of the main people bragged actually about excluding uh, lawyers and outside risk assessment people. They said they couldn't understand what we're doing. It would only be arbitrary. We, the experts, should be regulating ourselves. And you know, there shouldn't be outside regulation. That's a very arrogant attitude. And I think it's shown that they are incapable of of ethically reg regulating themselves and even ethically communicating the facts. Also, as it was coming onto the market, Ronald Reagan had just come into power and his one of the things he campaigned on was helping to revive the stagnated Jimmy Carter economy. And he saw high tech and genetic engineering as a major piece of that and promoted it therefore. Yeah. yeah. It dovetailed with the anti-regulatory uh, uh, policies of the Reagan administration, and uh, uh, as you're right, and in fact, it, it was, it's clear the Reagan administration actually wanted to make genetic engineering an American technology and allow the U.S. to get the edge over other countries and to speed the development of genetically engineered foods and other GMOs and do everything that was possible to minimize the regulation, maximize the output, and give the the United States an upper hand. And uh, partly it was felt because uh, it was felt that the computer industry had initially been 
the, the U.S. developed, but then other nations were able to basically take it over, at least equalize it, and they didn't want that to happen with biotechnology, and that's documented within the f first few chapters of my book. I uh, um, had a question about food additives. So I had heard, I think, on something that I read before that aspartame, another controversial ingredient additive, was genetically modified, and I was wondering if that was true. And also, um, I was wondering if MSG went through a genetic modification process. The, the, the reason that probably comes out is because Monsanto pushed aspartame and it was not getting anywhere, it was going nowhere. And Deborah Davis writes about this in The Secret History of War on Cancer. No other countries thought it was safe, people thought it was bad stuff. It wasn't even getting approved in the United States. And then Donald Rumsfeld left Monsanto, joined the, the Reagan administration, and within a month or two after he got into the Reagan administration, it was approved. I think it's still only approved in the United States. I might be wrong about that, but it's not widely accepted. Okay, um, so and then MSG, I've never heard anything about that being GMO. Patrick obviously read more about that than I have. If you're interested in food policy in general and some of the things that we don't want to look at in this country, Deborah Davis, that's her specialty. She's got a book called The Secret History of the War on Cancer, and I highly recommend it. So um, the I feel like the next step is like, well, what, what do we do to pull back the reins then? Is, is this it? Is it getting out into the media and into the general public? Like what, what you know, certain films and people have been doing? Or, or what do you think is the best avenue to kind of address this issue? So, I mean, there are different levels. One would just be the personal level. How do I make intelligent choices of what I eat or what I feed my, my kids? Uh, and that would be, I would say, in a way, you know, yes, there's lack of labeling in, in a technical sense in the US, but in a sense, these foods are labeled because if you want to be really safe, read labels. If a food contains products from uh, ingredients from soy or corn or canola, or if it says sugar and it doesn't say cane sugar, then it's almost certainly from genetically engineered sugar beets. If it says papaya, then assume it's genetically engineered papaya, unless it says organic. So if you learn, uh, if you learn what the major foods are, and you listed most of them, and and you can get these, the true fruit product. There, there are shopping guides you can download, and they keep updated. You can find good websites. Organic Consumers Association, I think, has has good. The Institute for Tech, for Responsible Technology, I think, has good ones to download. Others, pick your pick your favorite NGO site. Uh, and then stay up to date, they have shopping guides. But the main thing would be you are careful to avoid foods that have not been certified organic if they're a member of those species that have been genetically engineered. And you also look for the non-GMO verified project label, uh, which again is a better assurance. One thing to be clear about, the non-GMO verified label does not mean that it's organic. Okay, and there and that label is put on many things that aren't even have no risk of being genetically engineered because it's a great marketing tool. So many people do believe if that non-GMO verified label is on something, it means it's it's a healthy product and it's organic. That's not a warranted assumption. So what you really need is to see the organic and hopefully also the end non-GMO project verified label because even though organic is supposed to be non-GMO, there's no real requirement on testing organic foods to see whether they've been developing some cross-pollination from GMO crops or other contaminated in other ways over the generations. So there could be a significant amount, and we know there have been instances in which when testing has been done of a supposedly organic crop, it's been found to be too high a level of contamination to be accepted in Europe as organic. So the best, obviously organic is safer than non-organic, generally anyway. But the best thing to look for, if you can, is the organic label and the non-GMO verified, because then it means that crop was also been testing and there's been trace back, and uh, you know that would be the higher level. But certainly at least go for organic if you can't get both, and it's difficult. I mean, it's very difficult. But if you're really concerned, 
I think it's well worth paying attention to packaging, reading labels, going for the foods that are going to minimally expose you to GMOs and also minimally expose you to pesticides. I'm not asking like personally like that, that. I understand that's wonderful, but I'm thinking more it's like on a larger scale. So at this moment, there are only people who can afford processed GMO foods, right? So I'm thinking like, how do we as a, as a culture, as a society- Oh, deal with it? How do we address it? So the wider the political social- yeah. yeah, and that's a good one. And some people here might have much better ideas than I do. It's gonna take, I don't know what level of activism. Um, one of the things I think it does take is clearing away the misinformation and informing people. So that's what I've been trying to do. Initially, I was trying to do it through the level of the lawsuit, but that only went so far. So what I'm trying to do is just at least, as much as possible, clear away the clouds of misinformation and inform people about the facts so they will become motivated to, to do something. And I think, I don't think I'm the best person to give you ideas on how to become effective activists here in, in this part of North Carolina, but I'd love to see more of that done, more people make this an issue too, and get the word out. And, but you know, I will say one thing, that most of us, I can't remember who said it, this, what is it, six degrees of influence, I can't, but most of us actually have more influence than we realize, and most of us have connections with people who actually have some influence on one or another issue, and probably on this issue. And if we're able to inform them, and get informed ourselves, and if they say, no, no, uh, Pushtai's study was junk, or no, no, Seralini's study was you know, completely discredited, you say, no, it wasn't discredited, and you have the facts, and you can begin to change their opinion. They may begin to change other people's opinions, and it can become a uh, snowballing effect. So, you know, we know the analogy of a pebble in a pond is used a lot, but it is true. You start your ripples, start your ripples, and you don't realize maybe your pond is, is a huge lake and you didn't realize it, and those ripples you start are going to create positive interference with other ripples, and actually there's gonna be some pretty big waves that you have helped participate in. So what I would say is do not give up, because if you give up, in fact, very early on, it was, uh, I think, some public relations firm that was working for Monsanto and other ones stated candidly, well, the idea is that we get enough of these foods out there and everything and people just kind of give up because they feel, what can we do? They're already all out there. And that's what they want you to do, is to be confused. And if you're not confused, and even if you do know the facts, to feel so frustrated that you give up, I would say do not give up. And I would say, you know, um, one of my favorite songs is This Little Light of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine. You all have a light. And now, hopefully based on my talk, there's more illumination on this issue. So let that light shine and don't give up and uh, keep learning and keep discussing and avoid getting into acrimonious arguments because then you won't win. You'll turn people off. Be calm, be collected and just keep giving people facts and bringing it home to them too. Because many people are very concerned about what they feed their kids. And, you know, but I would just say, use your best judgment, keep the faith. And, and also, uh, I have a feeling that Patrick's organization and organizations they're allied with are doing some pretty effective work here. So I'd say get, get more uh, informed about Patrick and the work he's doing. So, and also, I assume the work you're doing just in the ecological field and, Anyway. What we do is give people ways to solve the problems without GMOs, but there's an organization in town, um, Debbie Athos founded it called Pure Food Partners, if you punch in that. She actually tries to help take action, you know, to get people aware. I'd say a well, simple thing anybody can do is almost every product you buy has got a phone number on it, you know? If you find something you wish you could buy, but it's genetically engineered, call them up and tell them, I wish I could buy your product. But I, I can't buy it if it's genetically engineered. If they realize that they're losing market, they're gonna start saying, we can source non-GMO sources for this, and then we can put that non-GMO verified on there. And the power, that's what's happening in Europe, is the consumers, as it's clear, the government is failing, but the consumers have said, stop, and it's pretty much dead in the water. So that's, that's huge, you know? And I would, 
you know, reiterate what Stephen said, that if you're in discussion with people, get the book, get the facts, and gently put those facts to people. I'm talking with several people who I really respect, who have a lot of scientific knowledge. I really want them to read that book, and they're having a hard time accepting it because it's so overwhelming. They really believe in this fantasy that this is going to feed the world, that we have to have this, you know? And so I have to find, and that's why our site is kind of good because you can say, well, yeah, no, you actually don't need those herbicides. There are these other solutions that work, you know? So not only you know, be in dialogue, but look at the other solutions, be ready to offer them. And I think Stephen couldn't be more right. It's not about arguing, it's not about winning, you know? That you, you rarely, if you win an argument, you usually lose the person, you know? So it's about sharing the information, hearing them back, you know, and being able to give them the information, what I heard from one of my dear friends who so believes in it, about the Sierra Leone thing, is very controversial, just very controversial, it's just so controversial. You know, and that's their trick. If they can create controversy, they don't even ever have to disprove something. It's just the controversy. You do have to have that information. Go back and say, actually, not controversy. That controversy was actually ginned up in order to keep you from getting the facts. You know, and here's the information, and here's the footnotes. That's what I love about Stephen's book. Is it 80 pages of footnotes? Uh, close to 90. <laughs> it's like incredible that it's you have the print. resources there. When they say, oh, this is not proven, you could go find that and say, well, here it is. You know, so use that book. This, Stephen's book, and, and actually Jane, Jane, Jane Goodall said that, if this book is, is read, or no, actually another person I think said, uh, could have the impact that um, Unsafe at Any Speed by Nader had that Silent Spring had, and it's only because the book isn't out there and the press won't talk about it that we're not getting that impact. This book should have that impact. That's why we had to have Stephen here tonight. <laughs> Jane Goodall also said he should win a Nobel Prize for this book. <laughs> so, well, they're ready to thank you, so let's thank you. Well, thank you. I'm impressed so many people continue to stay and thank you and and uh, by the way my book's not the only one in the in the field another very good book is uh, called GMO myths and truths and at least as of a couple of years ago you could even download that one for free if you wanted to read it as a PDF and uh, that's an excellent book and together with mine they're on, on either one on its on its own is sufficient to to win any argument really on GMOs, but together they're totally invincible. Mine gives much more of a history, it's more of a narrative, and it will be a valuable resource if you wanna, if you wanna get it. And an another uh, expert that r wrote a strong endorsement, Fred Kirshenman, many of you might have heard of him, he's, a, he's now a distinguished fellow at Iowa State University, and, and uh, he stated if the, if the revelations in my book become widely known, the arguments being used to uh, defend genetically engineered foods will be untenable. And actually they're untenable now, it's just the reason they're tenable is the truth isn't being widely known. So it's just important to get the, the facts out and I may be naive, but I continue to believe that ultimately truth will triumph. So, and uh, so I'll just keep speaking the truth. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.